I want, I want uh, we, we are starting on this, this it's the month of July, and you probably, some of you, I think, follow along, that we've been talking all this year about the gospel. We want to be a gospel-centered church. That's why all of the Sunday messages is around the gospel. And the month of July, specifically, we want to see that some lifestyle is not compatible to the gospel. Okay? If we say that I am changed by the gospel, then our life must show. Kalau kita bilang saya dirubahkan oleh Injil, maka hidup kita harus menunjukkannya, harus mengalir daripadanya. And one lifestyle that goes against a gospel-centered life is called hedonism. It's a big word. Have you heard of it? Oh yeah, yeah. I just told you. you, you can just read it. I mean, of course, you, it's there, right? <laughs> but hedonism, and we'll, we'll see. And I want to share oh, a, a, a quick story. So there's one General James Gavin. James Gavin wrote that the Air Force, the Army Air Force, they made their uh, trainees, you know, the, 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 the troopers, train really hard. Just, you know, pit them down and all the regime, all the training, all this. They made them very, very exhausting. And just, you know, it's just impossible for them to basically to do anything else after training. And yet, nevertheless, General Gavin says, the troopers always had enough energy to go into bars at night and fight. <laughs> they always have enough energy to drink, to chat, to pick up fight with someone in the bar and just, you know, make a mess of the whole town. And then the armies let, you know, and armies contacted and the, the journalists would come, they would have to punish all this, you know, uh, 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 all the troopers, yang nakal, uh, the uh, naughty troopers, and they would get punished. Okay, you have to run down the lap, you know, give me a hundred, hundred laps around the compound. They were exhausted and yet, it doesn't teach them a lesson. The next day, they'll do the same, go into bars, get some drinks and you know, get into fights. It is an interesting phenomenon. If we, one way to look at it is like this. Somehow, when it comes to pleasure, we always have energy. <laughs> right? When it comes to worldly desire, there's always room for more. Like dessert, you know. <laughs> no matter how full you are, you always have room for desserts. At the same time, no matter how tired you are, when someone calls you, hey, you want to go watch a movie? Yes, you're right. Or hey, you want to do this? You want to do this something fun? Yes. But when it comes to God, when it comes to spiritual matter, even when we are strong, we say, I'm tired. <laughs> right? I'm not here. It's weird, right? but that's, the, that's our heart. We, duty, we fulfill, but pleasure we rarely. So, let's look how how can we change this? What we need to have is, when it comes to God, we need to be, have more and more an inexhaustible desire. That's what we want. But when it comes to worldly stuff, carnal pleasures, even when we are strong, we say no to that. That's our goal. That's my goal. Okay? Uh, uh, let's look to our, our Bibles right now. We, are, we will be at Philippians chapter 3, verse 18 and 19. Just two verses. Okay? Filipi 3, ayat 18, ayat 19. Um, since it's just two verses, I invite you to read with me. You can read from up front or if you would like to prefer your phone, the Holy Phone, not the Holy Bible, <coughs> of the Holy iPad. It's, I'm, that's from the ESV, okay? Okay, let's read together in 3, 2, 1. For many of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. Amen. So, Paul is describing two types of people here, the context. In verse 17, he said, imitate me 
and imitate others like me who are following the way of the cross. But be careful, don't follow the enemies of the cross. Okay, so you, you have right there, right? Uh, Paul named his opponents as enemies of the cross. Now, verse 19 describes their lifestyle. In just a quick glance, you can tell it's a pagan lifestyle. It's a lifestyle that is driven by one and one thing only, pleasure. Good feelings. I feel good, right? That's all. So, uh, but look at that. Enemy is not a neutral word, right? It's not a neutral word. Enemy is anti-cross. It's against the cross. So let me ask you, if, I, if, 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 you, if you have to answer this question, when you think about the cross, take up the cross, live a cross-centered life, right? It's a very, uh, you know, uh, familiar slogans in churches, in, in, in ministry. What does it mean? What does the cross represent? At least I can think of three things. The cross represents service, suffering, and sacrifice, right? You look at the cross, you don't think candy land, no? <laughs> you don't think having fun, right? You think service, suffering, and sacrifice, see? So these enemies of the cross, basically, they reject all three elements. Instead of serving, they want to be served. Okay? Instead of suffering, they want comfort and fun and, 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 and yeah, and, and living however they want. Instead of sacrifice, they prefer ease. I deserve what I get. Uh, one lifestyle, um, uh, and, 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 and so, so, so these false teachers, they're actually in the church, but uh, they are uh, teaching this different lifestyle. So they're preaching the cross, but their life is made them enemies of the cross. They adopt what's called a hedonist lifestyle. Hedonist. Gaya hidup yang hedonistic. Yeah? So, uh, a hedonist is basically someone who lives, like I said, by pleasure principle. A hedonist says something like this. Happiness is found in having things. You should get all you can for yourself as quickly as you can. Security is found in money, power, status, and good health. You are not responsible for anyone but yourself. This life on earth is all there is. Those are some of the sayings that hedonists will, you know, affirm. I got only one life. I will make it count. How? By gaining all the pleasure that I can. There's no afterlife. There's no heaven or hell. Just this is it. But notice how Paul begins with thanks. For many whom I have often told you, now tell you even with tears. This is interesting. This is the only part of the Bible where Paul cried. This is the only one. And you know where Jesus went, right? When Lazarus died. Now he's Paul, stirred. This is the only one. Why? Why is he crying? He's sad because he had to make repeated warnings about these guys. I have often told you, right? Now I tell you again. These false teachers basically are not only, you know, living a anti-cross life, but they're also enticing, you know, tempting others. It's okay lah. Don't go to church, you can go to movies, you know, things like that. So rather than living a cross-centered life, they are living and are teaching a self-centered life. Dominated by passion, dominated by things of the world. Eugene Peterson in other translation, I love how he said it. He says, all they want is easy street. They hate Christ's cross. I think it's the name of a station, right? <laughs> King's Cross. <laughs> uh, but easy street is what? A dead end street. As it says, their end is destruction, verse 19. But it is good to ask, stop and ask the question this, right? Why are we so obsessed 
with pleasure. Now, one explanation from a psychological point of view is that we have a tendency to react more quickly to bad events. Okay, that's why when you have a um, that's why sometimes when I was driving down the road and there's a traffic, there's, there's traffic, and then there's nothing happening except adianaka, <laughs> except somebody's on an accident or things. You know, when bad things happen, people just stop. Whoa, oh, what's going on? But they never stop to see, wow, what a beautiful sunset. <laughs> right? There will never be a traffic because of a cool sunset. There will always be a traffic when there's an accident. That's our tendency. We remember bad events longer than positive events. Do you know that we tend to you know, replay bad events five times more than positive events? One article uh, called Bad is Stronger Than Good, four psychology professors wrote like this. Bad emotions, bad parents, and bad feedback have more impact than good ones. Bad impressions and bad stereotypes are quicker to form and more resistant to disconfirmation than good ones. So yeah, it's, it's possible that we are, uh, we are chasing after pleasure because you know, because the world is so bad. No wonder we look out to pleasure wherever we go. What is wrong with pursuing happiness? But see, church, happiness is not just about pleasure. Happiness is not just about pleasure. And let me illustrate with one of the coolest movies, good family movies that all you can watch. Do you know what this is? This is a movie in 2015 by Pixar called a brilliant animation movie called Inside Out. So if you haven't watched the movie, this is cool. It's uh, it's uh, actually one of my one of, one of my former professor is consulting for the for the science of the movie. So it's like cool, cool. Oh, Cutler, Professor Cutler, you're so cool. You're there. Okay. Um, so what happens is basically most of the movies, if you watch it, takes place inside a, the head of an 11 year old girl named Riley. Okay? So everything we do is based on emotions. So Riley, 11-year-old girl named Riley, have five emotions, right? So you've got uh, anger, uh, sadness, joy, disgust, and fear. That's basically how the psychological uh, literature also named them. Now, all of these characters, they help Riley navigate her role. Now, joy is the first emotion to show up. And when, when the baby, when Riley is born, she was at laughing. And so, so Joy is the first to show up. Joy acts like the leader of the team. She acts like the quarterback, okay? Like the quarterback, like the captain. The goal is simple for Joy. Whatever we do, we must make Riley happy, okay? That's the goal, very simple goal. So the film begins by introducing how each emotion work together to get that goal. Whatever you do, make Riley happy. Okay? So she begins a joy, begins telling. Okay, fear. Fear is good, she said. Fear is really good at keeping Riley safe. Because if she's not safe, then how can she be happy, right? Disgust. She's good too. She basically keeps Riley from being poisoned, both physically and socially. <laughs> Also good, so I mean, you know, peer pressure and all that. Anger. He cares very deeply about things being fair. So it's good, you have to handle the bad anger. Sadness. Well, she, well, <laughs> Joy said, I'm not actually sure what she does. <laughs> she always conflict with, with, with sadness. And so does we, right? At one time or another, many of us probably wonder, the function of sadness in our lives. What is the purpose of sadness? What is the purpose of brokenness, of, of suffering? So, throughout the movie, Joy tried to keep sadness away. Try to keep sadness away. However, the cool thing is this, if you watch the movie, as Riley experienced a crisis, a big crisis, moving to a new place, it was sadness that emerged as the hero of the movie. Sadness handles life better than joy. Why? Because sadness connects with people. There's one scene where 
Bing Bong. Bing Bong is another character, okay? And Bing Bong was sad, and Joy came in to, Joy came in to uh, try to uh, console him, but she's just trying to put a positive spin. It's okay, you know, yeah, things are going to be okay, you know, things, things like that. But, she's, but Bing Bong kept crying until sadness comes in and says, I know it's sad. You must be like this. You see, she can be empathetic. Yeah, she, uh, she can be empathetic and, 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 and connect with, with Bing Bong. And that's what actually helped Riley at the climax of the movie. Riley wanted to go, or she wanted to run away from home, but then she decided not to run away because she felt sad. She felt fear. So basically, at the end, Riley embraced sadness. And that makes her tougher, that makes her more mature and happier. And by the end of the movie, Joy, in the beginning, she was, you know, you go away. We don't want sadness in Riley. You're not important to Riley's life. In the end, instead of avoiding or denying sadness, Joy accepts sadness for who she is, realizing that she is an important part in Riley's life. The movie is teaching us that happiness is not all about joy. Or joy is not all about happiness, whichever you want to put it, right? Jesus comes, John 10, 10 says, so that we have abundant life, not a happy life. An abundant life, a part of the abundant life is embracing the cross. A part of the abundant life is embracing maybe sadness, maybe pain, maybe brokenness. It's healthy to have all five emotions just as it's healthy for us to have a whole experience of what means following Christ. And I love how John Scott puts it. He said, every Christian is, a, is both a Simon of Cyrene and a Barabbas. Tau ya yang mana Barabbas mana yang Simon ini? Barabbas sama Simon dari Tirene, bahasa Indonesia. Right? Like Barabbas, oh, it's cut, okay. We escaped the cross, for Christ died in our place, like Simon of Cyrene, we carry the cross. For he calls us to take it up and follow him. We are. Let's not settle just by being a Barabbas. Okay, now I'm in heaven. I mean, I'm saved now. We are also called to be like Simon of Cyrene. Okay, so, so it, 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 there's, a, there's an important part in, in living a sacrificial life. But let's, let's go then. How do we know if I am a hedonist? Okay? Kalau saya hedonistic, tahunya dari mana? Gitu. Apa ciri-cirinya? What are the characteristics? Well, the Bible is very helpful. It gives us exactly three characteristics. First, the God is their belly, the glory in their shame, with minds set on earthly things. Right? So let's go to the first one. Their God is their belly. Now I know when I say belly, you might be thinking about food and lunch, but <laughs> please bear with me, okay? Uh, what does it mean? Okay, in, in Romans 16, Paul says like this, okay? People who are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And their appetites, literally their stomach or their belly, okay? So people who are not serving our Lord Christ are serving their appetite. So, so belly or stomach is to represent a sensual lifestyle devoted to the things of the world. Basically for those who have no higher authority then their appetites will be driven by that. Their God, right? Their God, their, 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 their uh, ruler of the, uh, the highest authority will be their appetites. The God is their stomach. Basically, what Paul is saying, you are a hedonist if you worship your appetite. If you put, if you look at life through a filter that says whatever makes it fun. If that's fun, if that feels good, I'm going to do it no matter what the cause is. But I love this story, I've said this before in another occasion, by this, maybe you've heard of this story before. This is a, 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 a novel called The Picture of Dorian Gray by the novelist Oscar Wilde. Maybe you've heard of this. So it tells a story about a handsome guy named, obviously, Dorian Gray. Right? So, so one day he, he, he met with this guy, Lord Henry, 
walked in and, and he got he absorbed his philosophy. Lord Henry's philosophy is, you know, seize the day. Uh, how do you say it? Right? Seize the day. Live live to the fullest. Uh, don't limit anything. Whatever you feel, grab it. Go for it. No limitation. Okay? Seize the day. Now Dorian has a self-portrait. Uh, that one. Okay? In his home. And it, like, like you see in the, in the portrait, he was he was you know a healthy, young, strong, you know, and and, and he 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 uh, expects he hopes he can remain everlasting or evergreen or you know keep young like that uh, painting, and he wishes that he can be like that all the time, and just like the saying goes, be careful what you wish for. He got what he wished for. Dorian Gray, for 18 years, never grew old. Okay. For 18 years, he never grew old, and he spent all of his life with sex, drugs, drinks, and he's quite a playboy. Okay? So he spent around just breaking all girls' hearts and without committing to any one of them. So he lives, you know, awet muda, apa itu awet muda ya? You know, he, he, he cannot grow old, he's always young. Until one day, he found that the painting, that this painting that he put somewhere in the, in, the, in, the, in the attic has become like that, okay? Has become uh, ugly, uh, smelly, and basically disgusting. As if all that Dorian has done has been absorbed the painting. Rather than gets him, it gets the painting. You, you, get, the, you get the idea, right? Jadi yang kena korban-korbannya itu paintingnya seakan-akan, bukan orangnya. Somehow, the painting got the result of that immoral lifestyle. And at the end of the novel, Dorian repented. He somehow stabbed the, uh, this picture with a knife, and then he shouted out loud, and then he died. Because when he stabbed the you know, the, the bad painting, he himself become like that painting. He somehow became old, you know, and creeped and you know, basically disgusting, smelly, almost he cannot recognize him. And the painting goes back to normal. What is the lesson from this simple story? The lesson is this, I think. You can run after pleasure, but ultimately you cannot away. You cannot run away from God's truth. When you live according to pleasure, there will be consequences. You might not see it right away, like what Dorian did. Just live however as he wanted. But the consequences is there. Because like I said, we are living in the moral universe, not the Marvel universe. We are living in God's moral universe. When we sin, we broke the rules. We, we, like I said, there's a crack in our relationship with God. There's a crack in our relationship with, with others. There's a crack in our relationship with, 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 with ourselves. And there is a crack in our relationship with the creation. There is consequence of living however you want by pleasure. Be killing sin. I'm paraphrasing from John Owen. Or sin will be killing you. That's the truth. If you don't do something about your sin, that sin will do something to you. It will shrink your soul and break all types of relationships. Okay, that's the first one. Your hidden is if you worship appetite. And my advice to you is think about the consequences. You can, you can run away, you can run after pleasure, but you cannot run away from God. He sees, He knows, and he will deliver the judgment. You get what you? So. Okay. Secondly, um, these people take pride in their shame. Right? So um, basically what they say, they, they broadcast, they brag about their shameful indulgences. So it's like, it's like you know, somehow it, it kind of sounds very familiar in our days when you have, uh, when you have celebrities that have, you know, big mansion or have divorced or caught 
uh, uh, caught with, with uh, driving under influence, right? And they just somehow they brag about it. See, look at look what I have, look what I did. It's bad. They break the law, but they're so proud of it, right? <laughs> and maybe you have someone like, you know, uh, you know, I, I got I got I got I got lots of money, but I got it through I got it through this you know this channel. I'm 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 not working as hard, but I got it anyway. See, but don't tell anybody. Shh. Bragging about bad things. Somehow it becomes the norm. The glory in their shame. See, a hedonist basically is not only proud of having things, they have got to show them off. That's the point. They have to show them off. The latest purchase, the newest vacation, the recent conquest, all they want to talk about is their success, their achievement. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Even if it's bad, look at me. And they are allergic to weakness or failure. I found this nice little uh, thing on the uh, on the uh, um, on my uh, Instagram one one day. Some 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 guys wish this, and it puts some of the things that you and I might want to uh, pursue, right? So get married before thirty. If you're over thirty, that doesn't you know <laughs> apply to you. But you know, maybe this, I, I should say, young guy wrote this. Uh, retire with five million, become an also point and so forth. Look at looks like a good list, right? And looks like someone who pursue, you know, uh, maybe a hedonist principle. But and then the next uh, one is actually goes like this. I think you need to really re think about that list. Get married when you are really ready. Retire with lots of memories. Become an influencer. Fall in love, not with someone beautiful, but with inner beauty. Very nice. Obviously you want inner beauty and beautiful as well. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> make my parents proud by how happy I am. Make real friends. Find happiness in ordinary. Find someone whom you cannot live without. Simple list, right? It reminds us that Often, often, we put the wrong price tag on things. Let me repeat. Often in our life, we put the wrong price tag. Kita taruh harganya salah. Bahagia itu punya uang banyak. Bahagia itu ada nanti. Happiness is good. This is the price. This is. Sometimes we put the wrong price tag. We are proud of things we should not be proud of. We should not be proud of. Um, some of us, because some of us are addicted to what others think. We are addicted to what others think. So we think, oh, what should I say? What should I do? What should I do? <laughs> you know? Uh, how, how, what, what type of, what, 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 which school should I go? Which, which major should I uh, pursue? And all of the, all. And we, 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 we think that if I got that, I would be happy. There's a woman by the name of Sheila Walsh, a Christian singer, writer, a former co-host of the uh, 700 Club, that's basically a Christian talk show. She told us her story one day. She, she was you know, basically a successful, you know, from the outside, successful evangelist and singer-songwriter, a former co-host of a Christian talk show. Uh, back in 1992, she hit the wall. She basically broke apart. So one morning, she was sitting there on national television, you know, doing her, doing her job. But at the end of the day, at night, she was locked at the ward of a psychiatric hospital. I would guess that she had a nervous breakdown or something like that. And she said it was the kindest thing God could have done to me. The very first day in hospital, she said, the psychiatrist asked me, who are you? I'm the co-host of the 700 Club. That's not what I meant, he said. Well, I'm a writer. I'm a singer. That's not what I meant. Who are you? I don't have a clue, she said. Now that's right. That's why you are here. She continued. Sheila Wall said, I measured myself by what other people thought of me. That was slowly killing me. Before I entered the hospital, some of the staff said to me, don't do this, you will never again 
Uh, you will never regain any kind of platform if people know you were in the mental hospital and on medication. It's over. And I said, she said, you know what? It's over anyway. So I can't think about that. I really thought I had lost everything. My house, my salary, my job, everything. But I found my life. I discovered at the lowest moment of my life that everything that was true about me got in. She found God in places that she never thought she would find God. See, just like us, we sometimes misidentify what makes us happy. We listen to the world, we listen to the media, we listen to the selfish, we listen to our selfish desires, we listen to Satan. We listen to them. They are promising you, if, if, if only you get this, you'll be happy. You're not happy, you don't, you don't, you just go to the next thing, next thing, next thing, next thing, next thing. But it's only going to be next thing. It never arrives. See, because the, the, the truth is, happiness is not something to be pursued. It is a byproduct of pursuing something else. And what is that something else? Our unique calling in Jesus Christ. This is what I believe to be true. Happiness itu bukan ngejar sesuatu. Kebahagiaan itu pada saat kita adalah bahagia apa ya? Kebahagiaan kita kebahagiaan adalah uh, hasil dari kita mengejar lain. Gitu. And the biggest thing that we can pursue is our calling in Jesus Christ. Now for me, uh, I was attending the you know Thanksgiving service. On Friday, and heard, heard about Stuart. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I, cannot, I could not come yesterday. But when I was there, listening to all the stories, and all all the um, all all, all, the, all these sermons and testimonies, uh, it just it inspired me to to think like this. Um, one way, one question that helped me think about about my calling. Not, not, not listening to others. One way, one, one question that helped me is like this. How do I want to be remembered? So I, I, I just, you know, just, okay, Lord, I, I can't do anything. I mean, I, it, it's opportunity, that's what I'm saying. I can, I can do that, I'm, I, I'm open to this. But, and it goes, boils down to just one. How do I want to be remembered? If one day I'm put in the casket, what will people say about me? And that that question helps me to focus on the future. See, questions like what, what do I like, what should I do, is good. I mean, you should ask them questions. But those questions focus in the present, right? What should I do? Do I like this? Do I want that? But when I kind of shift a bit and ask, Lord, how do I want to be remembered? I look in the future and, and, and when I when I ask the questions, I immediately filter out what is the most important thing, what is the most crucial thing. Isn't it about Jesus? Isn't it about ministry, right? Isn't it about family? Those are the most precious things in our life. Not our possessions, not our resume. At the end of the day, I want to be remembered as a good dad for instance, as a good husband, hopefully. I want to be remembered as a faithful servant of Christ. I'm pretty sure at the end of my years, I don't want people to say, yes, he had a great house. No. I don't want people to say that. That's not helping anyone. I want them to remember me like Stuart, with someone who has given their life to Jesus. That is the most meaningful thing. And, and, and you know, you ask everybody, even if they're not Christians, they can even feel that. Yeah, 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 that's true. So ask yourself, church, what, how do you want to be remembered? What is the most important thing for you? Is it pleasure? Is it possessions? I think the more important thing is about purpose. Not pleasure, not possession, but purpose. Purpose in Jesus Christ. One last thing. Um, so, God in the belly. Glory in the shame, and finally, minds set on earthly things. So that's the last characteristics. All they think about 
is about earthly stuff. The entire life is summed up in the earth-centered behavior. So mind here implies a choice, okay? Because okay, I, I, I think I want that, okay? So we must choose. That's what Paul is saying here. You must choose. See, the same verb, you know, um, set, set, on, set on earthly things, that same verb is used with Jesus. Okay? In, 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 in chapter 2, verse 5, you have the mind of Jesus Christ. Okay? Here, the mind of earthly things. Okay? And the verb concludes that Paul's, Paul's, he sat on knowing Christ. That's what we have, what I have uh, read to you when we were, when we were singing, when I surveyed the wondrous cross, right? He, he has set his mind on just knowing, doing one thing, knowing Christ. But this guy or these enemies, they are different. They choose to set, yeah? set is a strong word, right? You can even tell by it. By how it sounds, set their mind. I choose this lifestyle. I think about this all the time. Um, I was. Uh, I spent a couple of days last week, and uh, yeah, this this couple of days and last week uh, went to a class at Saat in Malang. I went to uh, a class with. Uh, one of, the, one of the members of the church. Um, it's a child therapy class. <laughs> so, class therapy Anna. Yes, I went to a child, children counseling class. So, not because I'm a child. <laughs> Hopefully I'm not. But because I want to, uh, because a, a child's world is something that I've never, you know, uh, touched seriously before. I mean, I've taught in Sunday school classes, but I'm scared of, you know, I love children. I mean, I love kids, but sometimes when I ask to, you know, you know, share the book, share the word, or, or, or I'm, just, I'm, I'm, I'm nervous. I don't want to say. You know, I, I might have hurt the kids emotionally or something. I don't know. So <laughs> I took that class because I wanted to know more about the, the children's world. Okay, so it was an enjoyable class. We had fun. We played with dolls. And by the way, it's kind of like give me an, 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 an excuse to buy dolls now. So people ask me, hey, why are you buying some dolls and toys? Well, because of the children. So it's like, it makes me even more rohani, you know, the people in Japan are rohani. Yeah. Uh, so I had fun. We, we learned it's, children is, is not, it's, um, it's an important part of ministry. So I have so much, uh, bring so much for the Sunday school. And I hope that you two will participate in that. Uh, but one thing I remember from that trip is that actually a lot, a, lot, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of lessons, but that's for another sermon. But I was driving, we were driving back, okay? We were driving back from Mala. And then we stopped by to eat bakso. Bakso is what? Meatball. <laughs> it's still the, the famous bakso place, okay? Huh? What about bakso? Meatball, right? No? Meatball, right? Meatball, yeah. So we eat bakso, we had the bakso. And then afterwards, uh, we were, uh, man, uh, after we, 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 we drove back, but in the middle, we were driving back, not, not, not far away. One of our, you know, I went with two other, two other, two other uh, uh, girls, two other, uh, yeah. One, one person, one, one of our, 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 my colleague, she said, well, I think, I, I, I was counting the bill. She said, I think, I think I got a free meal. <laughs> I think the guy counted wrong. I mean, I, I don't think, I know, I know and then it's not, no, but so that's like tahu, you know. Because <laughs> they, 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 they counted by the bakso and the tahu and the, all the korengan, I don't know, I'm just losing the words here. So all, all those foods, right, all those items, I think, yeah, 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 I need to pay 15,000, you know. So what should we do? Should we go back? And Tiena was driving, Tiena was driving, should we go back? And I was in the at, at front, and my colleague, my new friend, she was back. Uh, uh, she was, you know, she was uh, confused. And so, what do you think? Hambanya, you know, what do you think? Uh, uh, God's servant, right? The Hambanya, God's servant. And I said, it's okay, let's just go home. <laughs> I, I said, just go home. And and then and then she said, my colleague said, we should go. The thing is, because I know I did something wrong. Yeah, sure, the Basso place probably have so many profits, they don't care about 15,000. But this will, you know, it will stay in my heart. It's just, you know, I don't want to have a guilty conscience. 
So, you know, that for a way to be turned around, and we, you see, just paid back. See, didn't even ask, just, oh, I don't pay, yeah. You know, I've got to pay the 15,000, and the guy didn't even check. Okay, thank you, bye. <laughs> so apparently, the shop even did not care. Like, we forgot 15,000, yeah. We get 15,000 if it's 15 due time, and that's different <laughs> matter, right? <laughs> but when that happened, this is what I realized. How can my mind be so quick in saying, just go? I was afraid of my, my heart at the time. Should, 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 should not be the first thing that comes to my mind is, this is a sin. It's small, yes. But sin is sin. Wrong is wrong. Should that be at least, that's the first that comes to my mind? Should, should I be at least suggest, I think we should go back? I was convicted that night. I should know better. I'm the pastor, man. Say, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I even said, the hambanya, right? The hambanya. Because at that I was, I was tired. It was, it was a long day, last day. We're driving back. All I want to do is just go back to Surabaya and sleep. So it's, in a way, it's, it's a human thing. But, there you go. At that time, it's a test of my character. It tells me that my mind is still set on earthly things. See, what happens, this is the danger, right? What happens if you keep hearing that voice, if you prefer that voice over and over again? Every time there's something bad going on or you need to do something right and you just, it's okay, it's okay. Be careful. Because our mind is very good. Our mind is very good at deceiving us. It will create excuses, loopholes, justification, rationalization, all everything. So that we don't follow God and we don't follow our pleasure, right? That's how our mind works. Because we are still, you know, struggling with our flesh. If we don't train our minds. Sitting becomes automatic. We don't want that. Let me repeat that. If you don't train your mind, sinning might become automatic. But if we put our minds on Christ, Romans 12 as well. My prayer for me and for you is that when we have a mind of Christ, sinning will no longer become automatic. Holiness will become automatic. Holiness. I want my prayer for all of us is that holiness will become automatic our default setting. Not sinless, not, not, not sin, not put, uh, purchasing, uh, going after pleasure. See, because ultimately, and we can all do that, we can, we can have this, you know, we can have this mind on Him, we can have this, uh, uh, you know, choose Him, because I believe that in the Gospel, like I mentioned in the beginning, God satisfies us. Ultimately, Jesus did not come to make your life better. He comes to show that He is better than life. Because only when Jesus is better than life, that is better than your comfort, better than your possession, your spouse, your degree, your achievement, you experience true freedom, right? You will no longer be dictated. You will, not, you will no longer be tyrannized under these earthly things. You can focus on Christ and He is enough. Hallelujah! Christ is enough, that the song said. I'm paraphrasing uh, that. Uh, yeah, so just comes to show He's better than life itself. So the final, I just want to leave you today, actually, with finally with two two applications, and I'm done. Five minutes. How 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 do I how do I start living a hedonist lifestyle and going into a cross-centered life? How do I apply or practice that to make Jesus better than life? How? Well, the text helps us, give us only two, very simple. In verse 17, it says, Brothers, join in me in, in meditating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have uh, in us. So number one, how, how can we live a life, a cross-centered life, not a pleasure-centered life, rely on others. Yes. Look 
at godly mentors. Rely on your church. Rely on the community. I believe that we cannot do this on our own. Rely on others. Pray and thank God if you are in a good church. Pray for your pastors. Pray for your teachers. Find inspirations. You know, if you cannot, if you, you don't have any mentors around you, read one. <laughs> there are lots of biographies around. I mean, when I'm down, when I'm just, you know, busy with life, and just, you know, uh, uh, you know, just stop busy. I, 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 I love biographies. When I, I, when I read them, you know, those, the, those people we, who have the most impact, all of them have the same pattern. Those with the most impact, they don't live by pleasure. They live by purpose. And that inspires me. I gotta go on. If he can do it, I can do it too. So I'm, I'm always choose. I'm, all, I'm, I'm always trying to chase after someone's back. I want to, I want to become like him. I want to become like her. Not in terms of achievement, but in terms of character. Because if she can, you know, give up her life to go to serve the poor, maybe I can too. If he can say no to that temptation, maybe I can say no too. See, sometimes we need to look at others. We need to look at faith in practice before we can practice our faith. Sometimes we need to look at faith in practice in the lives of others before we can put our own faith in practice. And secondly, in verse 20, 20 21, you can just read basically the second one. Number one, rely on others. Number two, look beyond the present suffering. See, I know when we follow Christ, life will not be easy. When we, when the, the car turned around, it took us a couple of, <laughs> you know, it was longer, right? It's not easy. We suffered, man. The, the gasoline suffered, you know? <laughs> And I, I, I suffer, oh man, I suffer from the guilt, guilt and you know, <laughs> suffer. Yeah, we, we follow Christ, we suffer. But, but, but Paul reminded, no, 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 no. There's a world beyond this world. There's a king that sits at the throne of the universe. And one day, you will make things right. Today, when you choose the cross, when you take up the cross, life might feel hard. But in God's eyes, he is pleased by what you are doing. And one day, one day, you will get your reward. One day, all the cards will be shown. One day, all the wrongs will be made right. Jesus is the true king who will return. He is the only one that has power. See, when, when we go to heaven, when, when Christ came, when Christ comes again, I look forward not only to the great judgment, but I look forward to the great reversal. Where the first become last, and the last become first. When those who are rich in the, in the world right now, who knows, might become poor in the world the next. Those who are poor here, because of the lifestyle they choose, because they gave their life to the poor, probably will be very, very rich in the next life. Those who are unknown today, you know, do you know that so many Christians are unknown? Everyone, maybe in heaven, we will sing or we will look at their accomplishments and praise God for them. The great reversal. So, keep hope. What you are doing pleases God and that's what matters the most. Rely on others, look beyond the present suffering and live a lifestyle that pleases the Lord, not pleases self. Let's pray.